and I've learned this. I've learned this. It don't ever seem long for me. Amen. Anytime I'm up here, it don't ever. Just, just about 10 minutes, Brother Bill. Just about 10 minutes. But take your Bible and go with me to the book of Mark. Mark chapter number 1. Mark chapter number 1. And I will say tonight that um, this will, this is uh, something that, it, to be honest with you, it's, it, it's, it's on my heart a lot. And uh, you'll you'll you will see why here in just a few moments. And uh, this is one of those messages that uh, I, you know. Of course, we pray about what we're going to preach. And I feel like uh, when you think back in days gone by, in recent weeks or months, even uh, we've alluded to uh, this a little bit. And now that the weather is breaking. And we are finally coming out, of course, I believe we've probably got like two or three more, you know, them hillbilly winters that we'll have to go through, you know, dogwood winter and redbud winter and different ones, you know, different times. We'll have a little cold snap. But, but for the most part, in all reality and all joking aside, we're, we're getting into the time of the year where it's enjoyable to be outside and with that, my desire is that this year, coming, of course, in preparation for our Bible school and then in preparation of trying to get our bus route started back here in the near future, we're going to be doing some visitation and uh, trying to reach people with the gospel. And that, is the, that is the sole purpose of the church, is to reach people with the gospel. Uh, they ought to, you know, a lot of times, of course, we spend uh, preaching uh, to those that are here and have been saved and been members of the church for many years because we're all facing the devil and the flesh and trying to fight against the world and the pulls of, uh, we, 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 and there'll always be times where we preach uh, in that, uh, in that respect, but uh, you know, our purpose as the church is to do our best to reach people with the gospel. And we do that cooperatively. We do that as a body of believers. But we ought to all purpose in our hearts to do that on an individual basis. As it is in Brother Terry, we prayed Wednesday that God would open up the door for him to be able to get back into the prison. And I made mention there in prayer room tonight, it just amazes me how that when, I don't know who it is here at church, but they somebody got a direct line with the Lord. And uh, we prayed and uh, God answered. And Brother Terry will be going back to prison May the 1st. And, uh, and many people, if you said that about many people, why, they, they would uh, not enjoy that. Brother Terry's looking forward to it. And, you know, when Brother Terry goes into the prison, he's going in there that he might win souls. And the Bible says, he that winneth souls is wise. Now, the Bible says that one man uh, plants the seed and another man waters the seed, but it's God that gives the increase. When all is said and done, it'll be God that'll do all the saving. It'll be God that does all the winning, but... At the same time, it takes somebody's got to plant the seed and somebody's got to water the ground so that God can sweep in and give the increase. And so many times we depend wholly and solely upon God to do what he's entrusted you and I to do. And uh, there's some responsibilities that you and I have as believers, as being born again, uh, people of God, we have a responsibility to try to tell people about Jesus. And so tonight we're going to look at a few verses of Scripture, familiar verses of Scripture in Mark chapter number 1. And this, as I said, is something that oftentimes these verses of Scripture come to my mind. And you'll see why in just a little bit. And tonight's message is, I guess what you call... Uh, a light-hearted message. You ain't got to worry about it. I ain't up here going to tell everybody how wrong we've been all week. I'm here, and uh, there's going to be some times when you're probably going to smile, and it's, it's going to be one of those messages where the preacher enjoys preaching. Amen? Because they sometimes I enjoy preaching more than I do others. Amen? If you ain't a preacher, you don't know what I'm talking about, but there's times when it's tough to get up and preach what God's laid on a man's heart. But tonight... 
A totally different story. So look with me at verse number 16 and the book of Mark, chapter number 1. If you'd like to stand as we read just a few verses uh, to reverence the reading of God's Word. If you're not able to stand, that's perfectly fine too. But uh, verse number 16. Now as he, speaking of Jesus, now as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, that's Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when they had gone a little farther, thence he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship, mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. And you can be seated this evening. I'm preaching a simple thought, a simple message on fishers of men. Or, as I it come to my mind this afternoon, man, fishermen. And it should be our desire uh, to want to be the people that God desires us to be. Throughout the scriptures, Brother Bill, you'll find many different examples of what God's view is uh, on his people or what God desires us to be. And other places in the scriptures I find where he likens us unto sheep. Uh, and the sheep is to follow their shepherd and to heed the shepherd's voice and to uh, go after and be obedient to the shepherd's bidding. And we understand that God uh, in his word has oftentimes referred to us as sheep. In this instance in the scripture, and we all know this story, and it's pretty much self-explanatory. There's really nothing I can add to or take away from this. And, uh, but we understand Jesus is walking by and his earthly ministry is about to start. He's about to uh, call his 12 disciples that are going to follow after him. Four of them we know were fishermen by trade. And on this particular day, Simon, Peter, and his brother Andrew are the, by the sea, and they are casting their net. And Jesus calls unto them, and he said, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And uh, I believe that's what God, that's one characteristic that I believe God desires out of his people is to have a desire to lead others to know him uh, uh, in salvation. I believe it ought to be a desire upon our hearts to uh, want to be that fisherman or, or that uh, fisher of men. I believe all of us ought to share in that desire of wanting to uh, lead somebody to know the Lord. And if you've never, if you have never, and I know people that have it, and for whatever reason, if you have never been involved, I mean actively involved in leading somebody to the Lord, I mean you've witnessed to them and you've spoken to them and you've prayed over them and prayed for them and uh, you saw the hand of God work in bringing them to a place of conviction and bringing them to a place of repentance and, and then they get right with the Lord, they get saved. There is no greater satisfaction under the sun, Brother Bill, than to know. And it's, listen, it's not about you and I. And it ain't about uh, uh, bragging upon ourselves. It ain't about uh, uh, being able to say, look what I've done or, or look what I've been able to accomplish because we know that we're not able to save anybody. Amen. We can't save a soul. No. But we can take somebody who is lost and undone in sin and on their way to an eternity in hell, we can take that person and tell them about Jesus and point them to the one that can save them. And, 
And there's no greater joy than to see that person you've prayed for and to see uh, or even hear of that person you've witnessed to when they tell you that they've got saved. And if you've never done that, then you don't know what I'm talking about. But those of you that have, I believe you'll uh, amen the fact that it is a great satisfaction of knowing that you've been able to lead somebody to the Lord. And as I begin to think upon these things, these, these thoughts have rolled through my mind about every time that I've been out on fishing. And it goes without saying, I mentioned it this morning, and uh, I'm going to preach about it tonight, about fishing. I love fishing. Y'all know that. And that's my, about my only hobby that I have now is to, uh, to go out there and try my best to catch a fish. Yeah. And there's others here in the church that enjoy fishing. And there's others here in the church that share in, in, uh, in my desire of wanting to catch a fish. And I want to show you some natural things, some things that uh, we have as it relates, and as I, can, if I, with the help of the Lord, I'm going to try to illustrate a lot of what's going on in the scriptures with old, just plain old modern day language. First of all, I find in our text that if we're to be effective fishers of men, because see, there's some things that goes into fishing. There was a time in my life, Brother Bill, I was a, a senior in high school. And I, I want to share this with you. And all this, I'm just illustrating things. And how, that, how these thoughts have rolled through. It's going to be a simple message, but this has been about, about five years in the works. My wife will testify. She's been with me about every time I've ever preached, and I've never preached on this. But this is about five years worth of studying and pondering that I'm about to lay on you in about 20 minutes. And so I find, I begin to think about when, when my desire, when that inward, there was a time where I couldn't stand fishing. I didn't enjoy it, didn't like it. Brother, I believe uh, uh, there's others here that may not enjoy it, but there was a time that, that I did not enjoy fishing, Brother Bill. But in my mind, I thought that fishing is not a difficult thing. I thought anybody could go out and catch a bass. And my desire for fishing arose from somebody else's desire. I don't know if you all have ever watched. And I'm going somewhere with this. It's going to be a Bible message. But I told you I'm going to do a lot of illustrating this evening. So y'all just going to have to bear with me. But I don't know if you all have ever watched. I got into the show River Monsters. Y'all ever watched that show? Anybody? Well, it used to come on the Discovery Channel, and this man would go out and catch giant catfish. I mean, I'm talking catfish that'd swallow a Volkswagen. That might be, you know, a fishing story. But he went out, and I got so enthralled with this TV show that I told my dad one day, I said, I want us to try to go down there to the lake and catch some of them fish that I have heard other people talk about. Because they do tell me that in Douglas Lake, there at the dam, they fish the size of Volkswagens. That's what they said. Said they so big that moss grows on their back. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but me and Dad, we loaded up one day. And uh, we had went down to the creek there by the house. And we dug us up some crawdads. And we took chicken livers. And we went down. And we started fishing. And Brother Bill, we are sitting down there fishing, and see, there's a difference between fishing and catching. Somebody say amen. amen. We were sitting down there and had been there for about three hours and had not got as much as a nibble on the end of our line. And there was some fellers with a bass boat come in right in front of where we was fishing, and they got to casting around, they got to catching fish right there in front of us. I looked over at Dad, and I said, Dad, I know why. I know why we're not catching fish. It's because we ain't got a boat. I said, that's exactly why we ain't catching fish. Now, I've never understood this, Brother Bill. People that fish from the bank will buy the biggest, longest rod to get their bait as far out in the lake as what they possibly can. And then if you buy a boat, you're going to do your very best to cast as close to the bank as you can. I have never understood that about fishermen. But anyways, we got together. Me and Dad did. We... Got to look and found me a boat, and I bought my first boat, a senior in high school. 
And I told Dad, I said, man, we're going to be the, way, the great white cat fisherman on Douglas Lake. We're going to figure out how to catch a catfish. And so I got my boat and I brought it home. And we went out on our first fishing trip to go catfishing. I'm going somewhere with this. Y'all stay with me now. I'm not just telling stories. Me and Dad, we got in the boat. We launched out in the boat. And I'm driving the boat. Don't know what I'm doing, but I'm driving. And headed up the lake, Brother Bill, and we left every bit of our catfishing bait in the truck. <laughs> and all we had was bass fishing stuff. And I, my only desire, I got, into, I got into fishing because of somebody, because I watched somebody else, because of somebody else's fervency and somebody else's vigor and somebody else's knowledge and somebody else's experience is what got me involved in fishing. Does that not kind of allude to how fishing for men is? Because, you know, I have a desire to want to try to tell others about Jesus because I can remember back to a time whenever I was lost and there was people that God placed in my life and there was people that God used in my life that told me about Jesus and about salvation and told me the things of the Bible. There was a man of God that stood and, and preached to me the Word of God in my Heart fell under the conviction of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because there was other people that God used to reach me. So as I begin to think about that, I begin to think that the whole reason why I'm into the natural world of fishing is because I watched somebody else. Because of somebody else's fervency and somebody else's knowledge and watching somebody else do it. I wanted to get involved. And, and so then uh, we can bring this 180 degrees and talk about serving the Lord. Once you get saved and you see others that are leading people to the Lord and you uh, see others that's got a desire, that's why you and I need a desire to want to reach people. Amen. Because that same desire will, will begin to rub off on others. It's important for you and I to have a desire. It's important for you to have a desire because the person you're sitting beside tonight may not have that same zeal and that same vigor and that same desire. But if you'll get a desire to want to win somebody to the Lord, they'll look at you and may want to get in on what you're doing because they're watching you. Amen. Amen. Does that make sense this evening? So I, the whole reason why I got into fishing was because of somebody else. And the whole reason why I got into fishing for men because somebody else. The main reason is the one that we ain't never seen before, but we've oftentimes felt him. Brother Bill, I didn't wake up one day. Y'all know my story, my testimony. I didn't wake up one day and decide that preaching is what I was going to do the rest of my life. No, God called me to preach. And there's some out there that they don't believe in a call, but the Bible tells us that we, there's a call of God on somebody to preach. I'm in this thing because of somebody else. I'm up here tonight because of somebody else. I, I prayed when God, when God orchestrated it and brought us to this church and I preached that first Sunday, the very first Sunday morning that I ever filled in, I prayed about what the will of God was for my life as it related to this church. And I am here tonight because of somebody else. I'm not here because I thought Solway was the place to be. If I had it my way, I love this church and wouldn't be anywhere else. But if I had it my way, I probably wouldn't drive an hour to church. Amen. I'm here because God told me this is where I want you. I'm here, Brother Bill, because somebody else. I'm a fisherman of men because of somebody else. And so we see tonight, I want to show you just three simple things and I'm done. First of all, the Bible tells us... As Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting, they're casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Now, in the biblical days, in Peter's day, they didn't have an Abu Garcia rod. They didn't have an ugly stick. They fished with nets. And if you've ever, uh, it's not a, not a very popular way of fishing anymore, but there was a, there was a, it was almost an art of throwing that net, a casting net. 
Some people do it nowadays for bait fish, but very rarely they do it. Do they do it for sport fish? But there is a there is a skill, brother Bill, involved in casting that net. If you and I were to walk out, I don't know that anybody is a professional net caster in here this evening. But I believe, and I believe if I were to walk out and be handed a net and told to cast it like Peter did, it would be a tangled up gom out there in the water because I don't have that skill. But as I begin to think about that, Peter had a particular set of skills that he had acquired through his trade. And I believe tonight, I believe that any of us that's ever done any, any amount of fishing understands that there is the skill of the tools involved in fishing. I don't know about you, but the first time that I was ever handed it, is anybody familiar with a bait caster? Real. See, growing up, I either had a push button whenever I was little, and then I graduated to the spinning rod. And a spinning rod's pretty easy to use. But when you really get into bass fishing, you're going to upgrade to what they call a bait caster. If you're not familiar with a bait caster, you push a button. It's a lot like the little, the, little, the little rod you use as a kid. The only difference is when you cast it, if you ain't real good at it, you're going to have what they call a bird's nest. And then you're going to have to sit down with a set of scissors and just cut all the line off your pole and find a different one. There's a skill, Brother Bill, involved in fishing. Amen. Any good fisherman is good at using what the tools are at his disposal. Any good fisherman in, in our day, if, you, if, you, if you're not into fishing, this message is going to bore you to sleep. That's fine. But those of you that are into fishing, this message will be interesting to you. And nowadays, if you do any type of fishing in a boat, there's all kinds of electronics. Now we've got forward-facing sonars now that will show you fish as they swim in front of your boat. There's no guessing anymore, Brother Bill. Brother Bill probably remembers a time when they had printed off on paper and you'd read a paper graph. Nowadays, you can see everything that's underneath your boat. You can see trees, you can see grass, you can see rocks, you can see the fish as they sit, and then some of them, you can even see the fish as they swim in front of your screen. But there's a certain set of skills that's acquired by learning how to use all those different tools. To be effective fishermen, you got to be... Uh, you got to have an understanding of the rods, the reels, the electronics. you got to be able to understand how to, how to and where to go. Same it is in fishing for men. The Bible says this, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You want to know the only tool that God has given us in order to win people is this Bible. And, 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 and if you and I are ever going to be good fishers of men, we've got to know what thus saith the Lord. I believe you need to know this book inside and out. You say, well, I'm not a preacher. It doesn't matter. Even though Paul was a preacher and Timothy was a preacher, the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable. It doesn't matter if you're a. It doesn't matter if you fill the pulpit or the pew. Every one of us ought to know what the Bible says. It doesn't matter if you're the preacher or not. Secondly, Luke chapter number 8, verse number 10, And he said unto you, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Jesus looked at his disciples 
And he looked at them and said, It is given unto you to know the mysteries of God. Too many times I've heard people make this statement that there's so we will never understand everything that's inside the pages of our Bible. You're looking at one. I have given up on understanding everything in the Scriptures. But we, just because we don't understand it doesn't mean that God has hid it from us or that it, uh, we can't cannot because brother Bill the Bible says it's given unto you to know the mysteries of God too many times we want to use that word mystery as a crutch to excuse our inability of understanding the scriptures when what we should say is I just don't spend no time reading my Bible that's why I don't understand it Amen. I mean, I said I wasn't going to be mean or anything tonight, but I mean, let's be real. Let's be honest. People says, well, there's so much in that Bible and we're not going to understand it. That, that, that's true, but quit using that as an excuse. Just be honest and say you don't read your Bible enough. Amen. And sometimes there are things. I, 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 I read the Bible and I read other books and I still don't, and I'll never understand it all. I, my mind can't comprehend it. And Brother Bill, I've even learned this, that I can study on a topic and get up and preach it, and in two months, if you ask me about it, I've done forgot everything I had studied. <laughs> really, I'm being honest. I mean, you study a topic, and my mind just don't retain it all. I can give it to you in hopes that it'll help you, in hopes that it will... Uh, encourage you and, and that you'll take notes, but if you were to come back to me, I'd have to go back to my notes. Two months later, because my, my mind is so finite and we're talking about an infinite God. And then the Bible says this in 1 Peter. This is where it gets everybody. It gets all of us. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. Peter tells us that we ought to be ready to give an answer when we're asked a question about the hope that is in you. In other words, what is the hope that's in us? Christ in you, the hope of glory, that salvation. We ought to be able to take the scriptures and tell somebody what it is to be saved. Amen. Now I understand that you can tell somebody what the Lord did for you. But if we're going to be an effective fisherman of men or fisher of men, if we're going to be effective, we gotta, we've got to have some skill of the tool that we have, and that's the Scriptures. Because I have learned this. There's many people out there when you witness to them, they don't want to hear your experience. They want to hear what the Bible says. And then they'll take your experience and they'll know just enough about the Bible that they'll turn you inside out and upside down. Amen. I was warned. I went with uh, Paul Carver one time, uh, and I didn't go to a big prison, but I went to a little prison, juvenile prison in Dandridge, and spent three days in there. And uh, they told me prior to going in, and I've been there on two separate occasions, spent three days each time, and they told me, they said, you better be studied up and ready. I thought for sure, Brother, Brother Bill, the first time I went, I thought for sure, well, I'm going to know more than they do. I'm the preacher. Brother Terry, when I got there, I realized Amen. my first time that if you really, if you're not prepared to give an answer, they know just enough about the scriptures where they'll turn you inside out and upside down and have you wondering if you've, if you've even been saved. And I went in the first time and it was a surprise to me at how little I did know and how unprepared I was to give an answer like Peter said. Now the second time I went in, I went in both barrels cocked, ready to go. But Brother Bill, what I, find, what I found was I... When I went in the first time, I was unskilled in the tool that God had given me. 
And if you and I are to be effective fishers of men, we've got to be able to use the tools that are at our disposal. If you're going to be a good fisherman in our day, like, uh, you know, Ot Defoe, he, he's a Bass Mastery Elite Series uh, man, and he, he knows everything about his rods, his reels, the electronics, can tell you where the fish have been and where they're headed to and where they're at currently. Same thing God desires out of us if we're going to be... Because, see, the Bible said he was cast in his net. When Jesus looked at Peter, he saw a man that was skilled in his trade. He was skilled in the tools that he used. And I believe when, God, when the Lord saw that he had set that much time, spent that much time to become skilled at casting a net, how much... How profitable he'd be if he spent that much time or sp will spend that much time learning how to use the tool that the Lord was going to give him. Secondly, there's the sense of ta the tactics. I want you to notice what the Bible says. When they walk on and when he finds James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. So now James and John, and they were also in the ship mending their nets. Mm -hmm. I looked this up, mending the nets. The nets were just, and I like, as I was studying on this this afternoon and thinking about this, I did look up and, and Adrian Rogers, pastor at a big church in Memphis, Tennessee, great preacher. Adrian Rogers said this about mending nets. He said that all a net is is a bunch of holes tied together. And you know what a hole is, don't you? Just nothing. There's nothing there. What are you and I? What are we as the church? We're just a bunch of nothings tied together. But in the right hands, bringing a large amount of fish. But in that day, they would tie. They were, they were, their nets was made out of ropes. And they would tie knots and they would tie and, and so what they'd have to do is after a long day of fishing and they call it toiling for fish a long hard day spent out on the water they would come back have to uh, mend their nets and tie those knots together if they'd have came you know gotten tangled up on something on the bottom or if they had brought in a large amount of fish they their nets would get wore down knots would come undone they would get dirty and then I read that in their day, if they, they would wash their nets. Because if they failed to wash their nets, the dead, decaying, dying matter left over from fish, whether they had died or fish scales, that decomposition would begin to decompose their net. And Brother Bill, their nets, eventually, if they didn't keep them clean and didn't keep them washed and didn't keep them mended and, and, and tied together, their, their nets would become good for nothing. And so then I got to thinking about if you and I, uh, if we were to go fishing, the only bait that we have, see, in their day, they had to keep their nets clean because they didn't use bait. They used that net. That net was the very thing that as they drug it back to themselves, that net would close up, close up around the fish. It's all they used. But in order for them to properly do their job of fishing, their nets had to be mended, they had to be cleaned, they didn't want something that was going to come through the water and look like something that's going to scare all the fish away. So they, 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 there was, there's the presentation of the bait. The only bait that you and I have is the gospel. I said the tool we have is the Bible. That's what's going to give us the knowledge and the understanding of what we're to say once we get there. And so the bait that we have is the gospel. And you know what the gospel is? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, For I delivered, Paul says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Brother Bill, that's the only bait that we have to cast out is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. See, in our day, in modern day fishing, you can go to the Bass Pro Shop, man, there's all <coughs> kinds of baits on the shelf. They've got different colors of 
wing dings and whopper floppers and all kinds of different things that you can throw out there. But you know what I find? And I, some of these other men will tell you. You can take all of what Bass Pro Shop has to offer and narrow it down and put in one basket, not even a buggy. You can put in one basket what you're going to catch fish on. They so much that churches are trying to offer people. There's so much that people are trying to offer people in exchange for the gospel. When really, Brother Bill, all we need, my dad told me just yesterday, we, we rode out together and went to Bass Pro. And we're walking through there. And we bought up some different, different types of baits and different things. And, and you may not know much about fishing and some of this be foreign language to you, but we had all kinds of different things. But Dad looked over and he said, there's one last thing we need to go get. And I said, well, what's that? We, we pretty much bought half the store. What else do we need? He said, we need to go get some of them green pumpkin brush hogs. So we walked over there and we got a green pack of green pumpkin brush hogs, Brother Bill. Now listen. That ain't the first time we've been to Bass Pro and bought half the store. And Brother Terry, there's been times we went out there on the lake and had all kinds of different fancy stuff tied on thinking we was going to be the next, you know, the next great thing. Only to end up at the end of the night throwing a brush hog for eight hours. Because they work. I begin to think about how that in life and in the church world so many people, churches across this country and across this world, they're trying to offer people something. Churches have adopted these, these, and I'm for promotions. I'm for promoting. I'm for telling people. I'm for trying to compel them to come in. I'm for, sell, I'm for giving away a bicycle at a funeral if it'll keep somebody out of hell. I mean that. I'm for whatever it takes. But at the end of the day, Brother Bill... The only bait we really need to be giving people is the gospel. Amen. What is the gospel? It's that Jesus Christ, he, was, he, he died for our sins according to Scripture, was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul says this to Timothy, 1 Timothy 1.15, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's the gospel. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And lastly, there's the scope of the trip. I'm talking about a fishing trip. Jesus, here in our text, we see Peter and his skill. We see James and John with their sense of the tactics involved. They, they had a sense. They knew that their nets needed to be in good condition. Same it is as it is when we present our bait to the fish. Lastly, there's the scope of the trip. There ain't never been one time that I have ever put my boat in the water that I did not actively go looking for a bite. Brother Bill, every place I go, I expect to get a bite. Every place in the lake, you're liable to get bit. People say, well, the fish go here, the fish go there. They'll be here. And if you know anything about bass fish, you know what I'm talking about. In the summertime, they're supposed to be here. And in the springtime, they'll be here. And then in fall, when water temperature gets 62, they'll be here. But you know what I find? Everywhere in the lake, there's a fish. At any given time of the year, there's a fish. If you talk to Miss Amanda, I watched Miss Amanda one night. We're talking about fish, and I'll tell this. I watched her one night, and we was fishing from the bank on this occasion. And Brother Bill, she casted out her little rod and a little bitty tiny. I'm talking about one of the little Aberdeen hooks, eagle claw, what you'd use trout fishing. She hooked a bluegill. I thought, well, she's caught her a fish. She hooked a bluegill. She's reeling the bluegill in, Brother Bill. And as she's reeling the bluegill in, there is a bass. Comes and hits at that bluegill 
knocks that hook all the way through that bluegill's lip and slides that bluegill about three foot up the line and bites that hook and she reels it in and has a bass and a bluegill side by side. <laughs> the reason I say that is Miss Amanda went out determined to catch fish. And we were bluegill fishing there by the dock where, where what seemed to be only bluegill. But she ended up catching a bass. The scope of the trip, the spot where we cast in our line. There's not a bad place, and I've learned this, there ain't a bad place to go fishing. There's not a bad time to go fishing. There's not, a, there's not a time of the year where you can't take the tools and the tactics and go out and get bit. There's not a bad time to go fishing. And you say, preacher, what are you trying to say? Well, I'm just trying to say what, what the Lord said in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, and I'm done. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. There's fish down at the Morgan County Prison the same as they's fish across the road at the gas station. They's fish down at the bank where you bank and they know who you are. There's fish at the grocery store, and the Ingalls, and the Food City, and the Walmart. There's fish right around your house. There's fish your neighbors are good candidates for salvation if they're not already saved. And with, a, with the world trying to give them everything and under the sun, and with liberal churches trying to give them everything, why not we just throw out a line and give them the gospel? So how can we do that? Well, very simply, the easiest way is to take one of them gospel tracts because every one of them gospel tracts that we've got back there contain the gospel, what the Lord did for them. And I believe every one of us ought to purpose in our hearts to be fishers of men. And I know tonight, I guess very unorthodox, preaching style and illustrations, but there's not a time that I've not been on my boat that at least one time, Brother Bill, that thought ain't crossed my mind. You will not know how many times my dad and I have been out there on the lake and ain't been having a good time. Or Well, it's always a good time, but ain't been, ain't been catching nothing. And there, my dad or one of the two of us will say at some point, throughout the evening or the day, whether depending on where, when we're fishing, if we ain't catching nothing, and I mean our target will be, you know, over in front of us, casting. I believe Miss Amanda, well, she spends more time talking to the fish. She'll just talk to them. She'll, she'll be in the back of the boat, fishy, 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 <laughs> while we're fishing. But you'll not know how many times we've been in the boat, Brother Bill, and we ain't been catching nothing. And dad will turn around and say, well, the Bible says cast on the other side. Mm -hmm. Or I'll do that. The Bible says cast on the other side. And we'll just throw out in deep water. No, there's not been, every time I get on the water, I think about being a fisher of men and different aspects of fishing and different skills and the tactics involved. And, and our main goal is to catch something. That ought to be our goal. Ought to be our goal as individuals. It ought to be our goal as a church is to catch men for the glory of God.